congratulations for taking ownership of your financial plan by tuning into the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast, hosted by Mason and Associates, financial advisors with over three decades of experience serving you. You will rest easy once your plan is done. You will see clearly just how you have won. Welcome to the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast, hosted by Michael Mason, Certified Financial Planner, John Mason, Certified Financial Planner, Tommy Blackburn, CFP, and also Certified Public Accountant. Mason and Associates have over three decades of experience helping federal employees with their financial plans. Uh, This episode managing retirement accounts during volatile times. Uh, We've got a special guest. Uh, John, why don't you go ahead and introduce our special guest? Yeah, we're super excited. Today we have Jeff Highback, CFA and Chief Investment Officer of SEM Wealth Management. So many of you have been listening to this podcast since we launched back in January of 2022. And as you begin to learn over these 22 episodes that are currently available, we focus most of our time on financial planning. And as financial planners, what we do is not only federal employee benefits, tax planning, um, retirement planning, social security, estate, and what have you, part of the service that we offer to our clients is investment management. And we've never really talked about how we manage client portfolios. So financial planning and investment advice is what we do at Mason & Associates. So tonight, or on this podcast, we have Jeff Highback, CFA and CIO at SEM Wealth Management. Jeff has been managing money since 1998 um, with the co-founder of SEM, Rick Gage. Jeff and SEM help us manage our client portfolios as our sub-advisor. And effectively, that relationship looks like this. We work together to design portfolios for our clients that correspond directly to that um, financial plan need. So for example, if somebody needs a moderately aggressive portfolio, we work with Jeff to implement that for everybody that needs moderately aggressive or moderately conservative or what have you. So each investment plan is tailored to a client's specific financial plan. And Jeff, um, we're really excited to have you. And I just also want to say that we personally, I think everybody in this room believes we serve our collective clients the best when we do what we do best. And we do what we do best is when we control the things we can control, which is financial planning, tax planning, and we allow you to help on the investment management side. And that's where you're focusing all your time. So welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed all the episodes so far, so I'm glad to be a part. Um, Jeff, have you ever done a podcast before? Uh, yeah, we used to run, we were early in the game with another financial advisor. We, we call it Sunshine Fridays, where I talked about the markets and the, some of the things that were happening for the week. And, and we do joke internally about, about Mr. Sunshine, and, and sometimes your economic outlooks are not always the most positive. But um, one of the things I wrote down preparing for this is one of the reasons we love working with you and your team is together the four of us can sit around a table and talk about why things are good, why things are bad, what companies are going to go bankrupt, we should short the S&P or what have you. But none of the investment decisions we're making for our clients are based on emotions, they're all data driven. So maybe you can tell a little bit to our listeners about what it means to have a data driven approach. And if you're curious as a listener who Jeff is, who SEM is, you can find them at semwealth.com. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think one of the interesting things is my partner, Rick Gage, is an engineer by training, and we have a head of research who has a PhD in electrical engineering. And there might be a lot of engineering jokes that people have, but one thing that they do not like doing is guessing. They like to have the data. And so that's really helped me throughout my career in understanding that behind every point in the S&P 500 or whatever investment you're looking at, there are humans behind that making decisions. And that means there's data behind it that we can use. And one thing we've learned is that our brains can tend to play tricks on us. And there's been a lot of things, you know, over the last couple of years, if you follow finance, they've talked about behavioral finance. And I think that's a fancy word of just trying to explain how we make decisions. And all of us, I think if we're honest with ourselves, 
we'll make wrong choices when we're dealing with difficult situations. And obviously with your investments, that's one of the most difficult things that you can try to make decisions on because money is one of the most emotional things that we deal with in our lifetimes. Money is emotional. Um, a year like 2022 can be super hard because it every single day we turn on the news and we're getting bombarded one way or the other with positives or negatives. We're being bombarded with political things right now on TV. So it can be very emotional. So as we dive into this episode, managing retirement or investment accounts during periods of volatility, we also wanted to highlight the stock market's always volatile, right? So this is not only applicable to how do we manage assets, guys, when the market's going down, it's also how do we manage assets when, when things are going up? So understanding that there are good times and there are bad times, but it's all volatility. And one of the things that we hope that we convey throughout this episode is that you should have an all-weather portfolio. And what that means, Mike, is uh, maybe you can share what we mean by that. What is an all-weather portfolio for our clients? It, and I think it's important, John, that folks know this is the 1st of November 2022 recording this. Uh, we just came off maybe one of the best Octobers ever. So to your point, uh, the market can be volatile up and down. An all-weather portfolio is one uh, that is designed to work with your retirement plan. It's one that you're happy with in good times and bad that you're not tweaking, you know, thinking that you're going to be able to time this market. Uh, so an all-weather portfolio starts with having a solid financial plan so that when the market's down, you're down exactly what you expected. Uh, and when the market's up, you're not disappointed. You're, your buddy that comes and tells you, hey, I made X percent in 100 percent two times the NASDAQ, you know, <laughs> you're not jumping into 100 percent two times NASDAQ. Well, we've spent you know, the collective group here. I mean, we have tons of experience doing this for a living. Jeff since 98, you since 1987, Tommy and I since 2010. So decades and decades of experience trying to convey this message. So if we put some numbers to it, an all-weather portfolio to me means if I'm in 50% stock, 50% bond. Generally speaking, if the s and is up 10, I should expect to be up about 5 and if the s and is down 10, I should expect to be down about five. And I should be in a portfolio where I'm always happy because those returns are in line with my expectations. And it, it seems, and Jeff, I know you have data on this, um, people are, um, respond much differently to losses, right? So if the s and is down 20 and they're down 10, they did poorly. But if, if the s and is up 20 and they're up 18, they're not happy. So it's just like trying to figure out um, the emotional side behind gains and losses. And maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, the easiest things to understand is if you just think of your own personal life, if somebody compliments you, that might make you feel better. You might remember that for maybe a day, maybe two days. But if somebody insults you, you might remember that for weeks, months, or the rest of your life. And what psychologists have found is that they identified emotional units and they, they found that in all aspects of life, we experience loss at twice the rate that we experience gains. What that means is we will remember all the times we lost money investing, and then that will cloud our decision making. That means when we're losing money, time actually slows down, and it feels like these losses are lasting a lot longer than they truly are. In the whole scheme of things, we looked back, you know, Mike and I remember the financial crisis of 2008. It was only one and a half years. But if you talk to any investor or advisor who lived through that, they felt like it was five, six, seven years. And people weren't even interested in getting back in the, the market. When you and Tommy joined the industry in 2010, a lot of people had to be convinced to move out of cash accounts. And this was a year and a half after the market had bottomed because of the pain of those losses. Yeah, many people you know, finally got back in just in time for this for the one. next one. You know, <laughs> so it gets difficult. And managing assets in the time during periods of volatility up or down, what we're hoping to do with our clients is one, have that financial plan that shows us how we need to be invested, but two, make sure that they're not ever looking to make a change, right? So as markets are doing well, we hope that we're getting enough upside that we're not trying to get more aggressive as the market's going up. Um, conversely, as the market's going down, the last thing we want is clients fleeing their portfolio and going to more conservative or going to the G fund. So it's a delicate balance, guys, of trying to make sure that clients are 
happy um, and getting those expected returns, but not fleeing, right? We don't want the tail wagging the dog. We want the dog wagging the tail. And, and unfortunately, people don't often get that right, which is why I think Tommy um, Vanguard did a study, Morningstar's done a study on this. Maybe you can highlight a little bit from those studies why we tend to see difference between individual investors and what the market actually does. Sure. So we saw uh, Morningstar has that data, and I think the other one is Dalbar. Is, is that Jeff's nodding and said I got that one correct? Um, and what they saw is I think on average the stock market may return say seven percent, and the average investor is getting three, or at least that's what the Morningstar report we looked at. Uh, rough numbers, what what it suggested. So what this means is that. Investor, if you would have rode that investment, been in that investment the entire time, you would have got seven percent. But people's behavior of getting in and out of the market, you know, allowing their emotions most likely to dictate their investment decisions, means they're not capturing that full return from the market. So that's that behavior gap that's referenced. Um, and when you mentioned, you know, that's why we really think the financial plan is such a critical starting piece to an investment strategy because that what are our goals and objectives what's our cash flow strategy how do we link all this up now we know the portfolio we need to have and I, I think gentlemen when we go through financial plans and we bring it back to the financial plan we all see that it gives clients not that markets up and down are not difficult but I think coming back to the plan having an anchor is what usually helps people, you know, stay the course with that that strategy that should be ideally put in place before we find ourselves in difficult times. And we don't want to overgeneralize, Tommy, but maybe we're going to a little bit right now on this this podcast episode is that we've been working with federal employees for three or four decades now. And the common theme for three or four decades, guys, has been federal employees retire, they live on their pension, they live on their social security and other guaranteed income. And investment withdrawals are discretionary. They are for fun trips. They are for vacations. And frankly, many times they're doing these things without touching their investments. So yes, the market is down this year. But Tommy, going back to your point, we're getting a 5.9% COLA last year and 8% COLA this year. Federal employees have most of their, if not all of their guaranteed income, paying all of their expenses. So what's happening in the investment portfolio isn't driving is my financial plan successful or not successful? Will I be able to stay retired? Will I be able to do this for the next 30 years? Their pensions are covering that. And I think when we can put that into perspective, it really de-emphasizes um, the doom and gloom or, or even to a certain extent, the euphoria that you get from investments doing well, because really it doesn't matter as much for federal employees. A absolutely true. And, and even for when it does matter, this is why we stress test, why, why we do things to make sure that this strategy is going to work. Um, and when we, we always try to shed light on the positive, right? So we try to, this saying I always think of is when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So that's why in down markets, we look at things, what can we can control? Um, currently I bonds have been a nice place to park some cash. Maybe we do some Roth conversion. So all of these things, maybe we do some rebalancing, you know, just what are, what can we control? And let's focus on that. And what I, I'd like to jump in for a second and just say, you know, remember managing your portfolio in times of volatility, Tommy, you used uh, the 7% market return and the f three or 4% uh, average investor return. That's the average investor that doesn't have a financial planner in the game. Right, and with that financial planner, there's been study after study, and you can Google it. Vanguard, you know, the value of a financial advisor in your world, you can pick up that extra three or four percent because you won't do all the wrong things at all the right times. Uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about the thrift savings plan. It's a it's a low cost investment vehicle, but they they do some things that that kind of help people that don't have financial plans uh, make some maybe not the best decisions. One of the ones we've talked about over the years is these life cycle funds, you know, where they have kind of a, a static allocation where regardless of what's happening, you need to have X percent in small cap and X percent in international. Well, Jeff, you've, uh, your portfolios have pretty much uh, not been in international. John, go ahead, and then yeah. we'll go back to Jeff. So I think you just teed it up perfectly for the last couple of topics for the podcast. Is one, we're going to talk about um, 
the TF, TSP lifecycle portfolio. So that's a topic we're going to hit on. Um, the last leg down of a bear market is typically the worst and like a little bit of an outlook there. And then three, we're going to hit on the G fund. So those are three remaining topics that we want to cover on this episode. And I also want to make sure, because I said something that could have been taken maybe the wrong way. It's not that TSP investments are insignificant, right? We see million, two million, five hundred thousand. It's what you've saved. And when that is up, it is happy. When it is down, it is sad. We're not making light of that and we're not telling you that your investments don't matter or we don't care that you're down. That's not the message. The message is you being down is different than somebody that has to rely on their investments to drive 100% of their retirement income. It's different. So we don't mean to, to not, it is your money. You've spent a lifetime saving it. We take that very seriously, but you still have most of, if not all of your needs covered in that guaranteed pension. So Jeff, let's talk about TSP life cycle portfolios, some of the changes that were made and why we don't typically recommend those. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost is, the life cycle funds by design are were put there because people make shortcuts and they needed help figuring out, well, how should I invest my money? And one of the things people typically do is they look at the recent performance and they kind of stack a portfolio that way. So retirement plans in general said, well, we need life cycle funds. The problem is, as you get older, you're always selling the, the money you have in stocks when that might not be the best thing. So when the market's down 20% for the year, the last thing you want to do is sell stocks. You actually want to sell things that are positive or doing less bad so that you can buy more of the stock market. And te- the life cycle funds just aren't designed to do that. Uh, and another thing we see with those life cycle funds, one, you know, that forced rebalancing and doing things uh, proportionally there, as you talked, maybe, maybe don't make sense, but, you know, they assign a number to them corresponding to a year. Usually the idea there is that, hey, you're going to, you, you plan to retire in 2040, uh, so this is what we think an allocation for somebody retiring that year should look like based on your age and so forth. But that's not really customized to you at all. And as John said, we can see people accumulate quite a bit of their life savings inside of a TSP or even in another retirement plan. They, they all have these life cycle funds, these target date funds we're referring to. You know, million dollars allocated just how something's been predetermined, that may not be, that is not customized to you. Your financial plan may call for a very different allocation. Um, so that's why, you know, sometimes I think of them as starter funds. Like it's okay maybe to start with to, to grow, get some accumulation going, but kind of once you get a, a decent balance in there, you want it to be customized to you, your situation, your financial plan. One of the issues I have with it, one benefit of the TSP. L portfolios or life cycle is instead of just auto enrolling people in the G fund with no stock exposure, or at least auto enrolling people into the CSI GNF and giving them a little taste of everything. So for those young professionals, it's not the worst deal in town, but Mike, think about retirement. Like you're pretty young guy, 61, 62 years old. And you know, federal employees retire at 57. So for a 57 year old, should they have been in the L income portfolio that had 75% G fund, give or take at 57 years old versus a 30 an, an, year retirement for right? a 30 or 40 year retirement versus Mike Mason retired at 80. You know, should you, should that person be in the L income? It just doesn't make sense. Well, let's, let's make it even clear at 57, you're, you're probably retiring and you're getting your furs and your first supplement. Uh, and you're not thinking you're going to take social or take your TSP money until it's mandated at 72 or 73 years old. So putting it into a, a an L income portfolio, uh, just doesn't make sense. And I can tell you, uh, Unfortunately, in years like this, where it's a political year and a down year, uh, you get a whole bunch of people helping you make these mistakes. Because I remember Kramer back in 2000, early 2009 on CNBC making this statement, if you need your money in the next year or two, well, this is not your stock market. Well, Jeff, we people can accept this in two different ways. You know, if if it's the person that you were telling me about that's in college, well, they need their money, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the problem with any of these strategies is they don't count when you're personally going to take money out. Yeah, and I might hear it. And if I hear that, I'm going to need it, which means I'm going to spend it in four years for college. So I need it now. 
But if I'm to spend it over 40 years, that doesn't mean I get out of the market. But when you have people with a media voice saying things like, your 401k is now a 301k. Well, guess what? Your 401k January 1 of 2020 is higher than it, it, it's probably higher today than it was January 1 of 2020, uh, unless you really made some mistakes. You added money to it, and the stock market's up over the last two years. So don't cherry pick your losses, and don't let the media help you make a bad decision because it's politically expedient to talk about your 401k being a 301k. And if I may, as I think about it, I don't, I wish I knew the episode off the top of my head where we said they're not talking to you and, and the life cycle fund being customized to you. And John, you saying, you know, we're not making light of your situation. We're not. It is that your investment strategy is very different based on your situation. And this is the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast, and they usually have a different investment strategy than everybody else. Um, so they're not talking to you. Maybe check that episode out if you haven't heard it. But I think that's kind of the theme here as well. And they're not talking to you. I know we used to say this in seminars, but the TSP lifecycle portfolios look exactly like the Vanguard target date lifecycle portfolios, which look exactly like the Fidelity and exactly like the BlackRock. But what's the problem with that? Federal employees have pensions. All these other life cycle portfolios that look exactly like yours are for people that don't have pensions. How does that make sense? Um, so a couple other things here on these life cycle funds is uh, there are different points in your life when you retire, Jeff, that we're driving income from the portfolio and our risk profile or our needs may change. So for instance, maybe I'm 57, 58, 59, I'm just retiring, I'm pretty scared, and I'm driving income because I'm delaying Social Security. That's phase one. Then phase two may be, I've turned on Social Security and I don't need this anymore. And then phase three may be, I really, really, really don't need this. Let's see how big I can grow it for the next generation. How does a life cycle fund fit that? And what would you and SEM be doing, um, both helping Mason clients as well as helping your direct clients? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this ties into what Tommy said about it has to fit your personal financial situation. And I always tell people that I'm working with is, let me help you create a life cycle fund that fits your situation. And that's going to be different for everybody. And with SEM, there's sometimes we say, look, the I fund, the international fund might not even be a good place for the next five years. And maybe it will be the best place to be in the next five years. But you shouldn't just statically believe that because some fund put it in there that it's it's what everybody should do. That's one of the shortcuts that we take as investors is, well, I heard international is good, therefore I need to have it in my portfolio. Or even worse, international fund or S fund or whatever it might be performed really well over the last three, six, nine, 12 months. So I'm going to put a bunch of my money in that one. And, and we see that happen a lot. So the life cycle funds, like you said, are good starter funds, but not necessarily good as you get closer to that retirement. As that balance starts going up, the rule of thumb I always use is if your contributions for the year are smaller than the total value, you probably need at least some sort of advice on creating your own fund. That's awesome. And and Jeff, as we think about this, you know, I I like to think that clients may go through three phases. They may they're gonna be their most conservative probably the year they retire. That's when they're most scared. That's when they're first taking those withdrawals. So we may scale back the risk a little bit. And then we could see over time, as people depend less and less on their portfolio, and we have less and less years of withdrawals, actually see that risk increasing again. And that's, to your point, you're not getting that in a life cycle fund. You actually need professional advice. So quick other updates, and then we're going to transition to the next topic. It was like two years ago, guys, where TSP arbitrarily increased the risk of the life cycle funds over a period of time, and they added more international exposure. Um, this is completely counter to you know hindsight being 2020. Maybe we didn't want to get more aggressive, and hindsight being 2020, we probably didn't want to add more international when they did that. So relying on a TSP board to make your financial investment decisions for you is probably not the way to go. So next topic, the second or third leg down of a bear market. Um, Jeff, in your expert opinion, we talked about this all day today um, with you. Where are we in this current market cycle and, and what should 
federal employees expect as we go into this maybe end of year, beginning of next year? Yeah, very good question. And just as, you know, as Mike pointed out, it's the first day of November. So if you're listening to this of 2022, so whenever you're listening to this, this is how our thought process then, but this is applicable to all markets because markets move in cycles and we're going to be here again five, seven years from now. It's important to understand when the market first starts going down, which we saw in January, investors fail to adapt to new information. Everybody thought everything was great. They don't even realize anything's wrong, but then the market starts going down. People start to write that off of, oh, this is just a correction. It's going to come back. As you guys said in your other podcasts, they're not talking to you. The media is going to be very loud. Then people start to get a little bit worried and you have that second leg down, which is what I believe we went through over the, the spring and summer and you're going to have fits of, of big rallies and then a test of new lows because then everybody starts to look out as, well, maybe things are getting bad. In the third leg down, you actually start with a nice rally where everybody says, you know, things aren't as bad as I thought they were going to be. And you get the, this kind of enthusiasm building back up. Well, maybe it's not going to be bad as last time. And that's what we're seeing right now is people are looking at 2008, 2009 and saying, well, no banks are failing people's balance sheets are better off, et cetera, et cetera. Or they look at the tech bubble and they say, well, tech stocks aren't as overvalued. Therefore, we're not going, going to be as bad. That's actually hindsight bias on, on the downside because people are ignoring what are some other things that could go wrong. And in this case, what we're always worried about is a recessionary bear market. Despite debates we had this morning about whether or not we're in a recession, despite what different news organizations say. The data says we're not, and there's actually a board of people who determine whether it's a recession and they're apolitical. What we're worried about is when jobs decline and spending declines. That's a recession. When that happens, the market participants, investors will really begin to panic because now, remember right now they're thinking that, hey, maybe it's not gonna be as bad. Things start getting real. When you see your neighbors getting laid off, maybe you're getting laid off, earnings are declining, things are getting tight. That is that last scary leg down, what we call capitulation, where everybody hates stocks. That statistic Tommy was talking about, where how does the average investor not keep up with the long-term performance? That's because they sell at the worst point. That's when the market's going down. It's also a, a saying, I think, that comes to mind that we were talking about before we started recording is um, in the short term, the markets are a voting machine. So very much driven by sentiment, as uh, Jeff was discussing with us. And long term, they're a weighing machine. So that's when it's more data-based, how's the economy, how are companies actually doing versus just what is our sentiment on the up or the down. So short term, voting machine, long term, weighing machine. Absolutely. And we have a mug in our office that, that has a famous quote from a hedge fund manager that says, the stock market is a story of cycles of overreactions in both directions. So we'll just say, on average, depending on your look back period, about 10% is the average return for the S&P 500 over very long periods of time. It's very rare it hits 10%. You get cycles where it might average 15% for seven or eight years, but then you go through a big correction because it was not possible for the economy to keep up with what the market was trying to do. So. When people start feeling bad, they start selling, and then it just kind of becomes this vicious cycle downward. We're really excited, and this is just a little bit of a glimpse into Mason and Associates and, and how we work with our clients, but we're doing a webinar, uh, basically a client event, and Jeff's going to be on that too. Thank you, Jeff, for being there. And what we've started to see is is a little bit of that concern creeping in. We're, we're 11 months into this market that we haven't seen in quite some time. And we're starting to get the sense that our clients are starting to get a little bit on edge. They're starting to get a little bit antsy. And we wanted to get in front of that. And, and this is the type of stuff like financial planners, the advice, generally speaking, stay the course, right? So you call your financial planner right now, Joe, I'm down. Joe's going to tell you to stay the course. We're saying the same thing too. The investment strategy you had in January, if it was aligned with a financial plan, is still good. That doesn't mean there may not be some changes along the way, but this is a tough time. We're taking the opportunity to get in front of our clients, present, do these webinars to make sure that clients are confident, not only in their financial plan, but their investment plan. Uh, Mike, how are we preparing clients for this? Because we've been talking all year that 
we could be in a recession, that this could be a, a one-year deal, but let's plan for two. So how are we educating our clients, our federal employees on how to, to get ready for this and brace for this, knowing that, that we only may be halfway through? Yeah, when we think about it, and you used 11 months, we're 11 months into this, and I would like to think maybe we're 20 months into it. I'd like to think, you know, uh, people's world was rocked March of, of uh, 2020, right, when uh, COVID hit and the market dropped. And imagine, you know, you took your money out then, and then 2021, it came back in and it came back up and you finally decided to get back in. So we're helping them understand. We're helping them understand that those kind of herky-jerky moves, you know, can cost you a big, big swing. Our clients don't make those herky-jerky moves. What we do with our clients, one, is reemphasize that the plan has looked at a thousand scenarios, you know, over a 30-year horizon, that their income their biggest source of income and their biggest assets, their pension. And over two years, uh, once January 1 gets here, they'll have had 14 to 15% pay raises on Social Security, CSRS, and FERS. Uh, so it, begins, it, it gets easier and easier to help them stay the course and understand that, yes, we may go down, we may go down 10% from here, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> you just went up 10%. You know, over the last over the last month, so bouncing in and out is, is difficult. Our clients typically don't do that. It, I, I was just going to add the most important thing. You keep hitting on it without saying it specifically is you need to meet expectations. If you expect it to go down another seventeen twenty two percent, and it doesn't, that's great. Yeah, I have been Tommy, <laughs> Tommy saying we celebrate. But if you're ready for that and it happens, and you know that your plan can handle it. It's, it's literally a non-event. It's, it's a normal part of investing. So your expectations are key. And too many people, I think, get into the market thinking that they, it can't lose money because their recent history said it doesn't lose money. So you've got to frame your expectations properly. Or, or they get to the point of, well, it's going to be different this time. Well, let me tell you, it, the only way it's different this time is everything falls apart. Because if, if our markets don't bounce back like they have statistically – over over time, then America's not bouncing back, right? And then we've got bigger problems than your stock market is down. Well, that sounds like something right out of Armageddon, the scariest environment imaginable. Right. It, it, oh, right, yeah. There's, I don't know if anybody has a playbook for, <laughs> for that scenario you're talking about. That's a uh, whole other podcast that I wouldn't mind hosting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess as I was thinking here, maybe just to repeat a little bit, but we want to have that strategy in place. And the strategy, to Jeff's point, if the expectations were correct, the strategy was correct, the strategy stays the same. Doesn't mean that nothing is that nothing is happening inside of that strategy. So there are things happening within the portfolio based upon what we're being dealt, but the strategy has stayed the same. There have been changes made. Um, and... Uh, the other thing I think we educate clients on, which which I think we're all saying too, is when you get into these volatile markets, this is this is when you can really cause some damage to your financial plan if you don't stick with the strategy because it can move very quick in either direction. And if you get it wrong, if you don't have the strategy in place, um, you know it can be pretty detrimental long term. Well, Tommy, you said it perfectly. Our clients are not invested. We we use, we have an active philosophy at Mason and Associates. So it's long-term in nature, but we make active tactical adjustments, Jeff, with your help. And, and our clients are not invested the same way they were in January. And sometimes just knowing that we were able to dial back some risk and make some adjustments and shorten duration and what have you, um, we're not invested the same way. And seeing that we have that activity has really helped clients. So showing that, not going to cash across the board, but making some tweaks. And then we had uh, breakfast the other day with a dear friend and we were just talking that so much of our job, Mike, is putting things into perspective. You know, and you mentioned that earlier when you said your portfolio is the same spot it was in the fall of 2020. You gave back one year of gains. Let's put that into perspective. Let's zoom out and let's really talk about that. I have a client who just recently finished building a house and when we did the plans for it, interest rates were three and a half percent. They just closed at six and a half. Their cost of living adjustments on their federal pension took care of it. 
They're they're out of pocket the exact same amount had they not gotten any colas and would have closed at three and a half. So taking it and putting things into perspective, last note here, which I think all of you agree with, is if a federal employee, a client of ours was to call in and say, Mike, John, Tommy, Ken, Ben, I'm really worried. And Jeff, I know you do this too. I'm really worried. The advice is not going to be open a bottle of wine and don't look at your statement. It's going to be, we planned for this. We were ready for this. We were all ready for this. What has changed in your life that you are now concerned? Let's talk about why you're feeling like you need to make a change. Was there a terminal illness? Is there a diagnosis? Are you going through a divorce? Is something happening with the kids? What are the reasons that you're calling today? Let's talk about that because the ultimate advice otherwise will probably be stay the course, but we want to figure out why you're actually making this call today. Yeah, and I I think when I just visited Liberty University and talked to a bunch of college students, and thankfully a lot of them are getting psychology minors now. I think our role as financial advisors is a lot of time to just listen. You know, so if you're feeling concerned, that's what you guys at Mason Associates do is let's just talk about your feelings. What what's changed to make you not want to stick with the plan and then circle back to you know the root causes of, of what's happening. So a few seconds, minutes left in this podcast, I think maybe let's just touch a little bit on the G fund. And and I've always kind of joked that this is G for guaranteed to lose money fund. Um, But where do we see the G fund today? Where do we see it in the future? And and what's maybe kind of like a tactical or, or an immediate opportunity that we could see on the horizon for federal employees? Yeah, I'll I'll talk first just because, again, going back to how a lot of times on the TSP platform you pick is based on performance. Obviously, when you look at this in November 2022, that's your best performing asset. Please, please, please understand that when assets outperform, they tend to underperform. And the, the mechanisms behind the G fund, if what we believe is true is that we go into a recession, but sometime in 2023, we climb out of it. The G fund is likely to be your lowest performer on the whole platform. So be careful with that. I'll leave the rest to you guys. Yeah, I would see an opportunity, you know, if, if uh, you're 59 and a half or you're about to retire and you move to the G fund, many people do that don't have Mason and Associates in their game. Uh, here's an opportunity to say, I didn't go down. Maybe I made 2% and uh, there's bonds Uh, that Jeff, high yield bonds is an interesting option. There's an opportunity to dollar cost average back into an investment with a money manager. So it's it's a unique opportunity if you made a, a good call it's always tough to get back in, isn't it? If you made a good call and you got out. You gotta be right twice, yeah, right? And we don't even know if you were right the first time, right. but we, maybe we can be right the second time. To me, it brings me back to we want a dynamic portfolio, not just all of one you know, flavor to it being the G fund. Um, and the other thing, John, you mentioned guaranteed to lose money, and I just wanted to touch on that because I believe what we're saying there is, yes, it doesn't go down in value, but inflation, as we all have been experienced, is real. So there's no statement risk there. You are not keeping pace with inflation. We do not expect that you will keep pace with inflation in that fund over a long period of time either. So maybe you don't see negative values on the piece of paper, but it's not keeping up with inflation. Yep. And we've helped clients allocate money to the G fund. I don't think we've ever recommended a 100% G fund for a long-term allocation, but part of our typical strategic allocation will say 60% stock, 40% bonds. And then a sizable portion of that bond is going to be G because it doesn't have any statement risk. Um, we may be considering flipping that and, and adding more to F, less to G, but we want to have that active management on the bond side. So G fund has been a safe haven this year. You want to think about maybe if you are eligible for 59 and a half transfers, You can do things like Roth conversions in an IRA. You have a lot more asset classes available to you. Uh, Maybe a good time through the help of a professional fee-only fiduciary financial planner, which means somebody that's on your side that's not going to help you get a 7% commission product and never call you again. Um, Never do... Well, I shouldn't say never. Be careful about Mike transferring too much of your TSP because we want to leave our door, our foot in the door in case we ever um, want to move back. 
Yeah, if you, you may make a, a, a bad choice. Maybe you thought this advisor was, was better than he or she is. You know, as long as you leave money back in TSP, you can always roll the money you rolled out back into the thrift savings plan. Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, it flew by. It, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I think we go, we always set out for 25 or 30 minutes. I don't know how long this one went, but I know it went longer, uh, but we're excited. Um, we're Mason and Associates, masonllc.net. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the email questions we're receiving. Remember, your investment strategy should coordinate with your financial plan. It should be well thought out and you should be happy in good times and bad. At no time should you be thinking, I need to make a change if it's coordinating with your financial plan. Remember, control the things you can control and your largest asset is not your house, it's not your thrift savings plan, it's those federal employee pensions. You will rest easy once your plan is done You will see clearly just how you have won The topics discussed on this podcast represent our best understanding of federal benefits and are for informational and educational purposes only and should not be construed as investment, financial planning, or other professional advice. We encourage you to consult with the Office of Personnel Management and one or more professional advisors before taking any action based on the information presented.